Yes, friends. Welcome to Galaxy Online Learning, powered by Galaxy Tutorials. I am Sunil Desa, and we are studying history, chapter three, making of a global world. In this uh, lecture four, we are going to study the fourth unit of this chapter, rebuilding a world economy, the post-war era. Now, this post-war, this war we are talking about is the Second World War. The First World War ended up in 1918 and 20 years later, around 20 years later, that is on the uh, 1st of September 1939, the Second World War started. And this Second World War ended on the 2nd of September 1945, that is for six years this war was going on and this was the most destructive war, more destruction than what occurred in the first world war. This again was fought between two powerful blocks. One was the allies that were beaten, the allied nations that were beaten, France, Russia and America. And against them were the Axis powers, that was Germany. Now it was the Nazi Germany, ruling, ruled by Hitler. Then Japan and Italy. Okay. This, the difference between the two wars was that this war, the Second World War, was fought in different places, far flung places. They had different fronts. It was fought over land. It was fought over sea, it was fought over air. Okay? And the death and destruction was very, very high. In the First World War, 9 million people died. They were mainly soldiers and 20 million were injured. But in the Second World War, 60 million people, which was 60 million people, that is about 3% of the world's population of 1930 died. They were soldiers as well as civilians dying. Okay. They were um, dying at the war front as well as places far flung. Many died because of the effect of the war. Okay. So, these deaths were not direct deaths. These were direct deaths as well as indirect deaths also. So just imagine if 16 million people have died, then how many million must have got injured? So just imagine the seriousness of the horrified condition after this war, what must be the condition, okay? So in this world war, vast portions of Europe and East Asia were destroyed, several city, cities were bombarded by aerial bombing or by artillery attacks. Artillery attacks means through tanks, through cannons, cannonballs, okay. They were, many cities were devastated, okay. The war caused an immense amount of economic devastation and social disruption, okay. So, reconstruction was really very difficult after the six years of World War II. So, the two crucial influences which shaped post-war reconstruction were the first was the U.S. emerged as the dominant economic, political and military power in the Western world, United States of America, after the World War II, emerged as a dominant player in what? The economic, political and military power. Okay. The second was the dominance of the Soviet Union. Okay. It had made huge sacrifices and destroyed the and led to defeat of the Nazi Germany. Okay, it had defeated Nazi Germany from a agricultural country, a backward agricultural country, it had transformed itself into a world power when the capitalist world was fighting under depression. So two powers emerged after this war. 
two superpowers. One was America and the other was the Soviet Union. Okay, now let us see the post war settlements and the Bretton Wood distributions. Now, after this World War, there need to be rehabilitation on economic on economic level. Okay, so after the wars and during the war, what the economies fell that to sustain mass production, we saw mass production was started, it had become the characteristic of industrial growth after the First World War. But the economists and the politicians also, they, what they found was that if you have to sustain uh, um, this mass production, then there should be mass consumption. Then only mass production can sustain. Without of mass consumption, how can mass production sustain? So, they thought that for mass production to sustain, you need to have mass consumption. Okay, but for mass consumption, again, you need high and a stable income. People should have high income, people should have stable income, then only they can consume. Okay, so there should be ma mass, on a mass scale, there should be high and stable income. And incomes could not be stable if employment is unstable. So they need a regular income, um, a regular employment. Okay, they need full employment. If they are fully employed, then only they can get high incomes. And if they can get high income, then only mass consumption is possible. Okay, and this full employment is not possible only by the market. So the government has to intervene to step or the government has to step to minimize the equation in prices. The government has to step to uh, fight against, uh, to uh, make a strategy for employment. Okay. So, economic stability, what the economists thought, the economists thought that economic stability can be occurred only if the government, respective governments, intervene. Okay. The second lesson related to a con country's economic links with the outside world. Okay. The second lesson was learned was that it related to a country's link with the outside world. Okay. How the government has a, the government should have the power to control the flow of goods, to control the flow of capital, to control the flow of labor. Thus, the main aim of the post-war economic system was to preserve economic stability, to preserve economic stability through full employment in the industrial world. Okay, so the main aim or the main priority was to preserve economic stability through full employment in the industrial world. And a framework of this was agreed upon at a conference. The conference was named the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, which was held in July 1944 at the Bretton Woods Hotel, uh, Bretton Woods at a uh, Mount Washington Hotel. Okay, you can see the picture on the right on page number 99. You have the picture. Okay, the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, which is in US. Okay, there a conference was held. Okay, with the new uh, the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference that was held in 1944. And in this conference, okay. Two financial institutions were formed. One was the International Monetary Fund or the IMF to deal with external surplus and deficits of its member nations. And the second, the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, which is also called as the World Bank to set up finance post-war reconstruction. The two organizations, economic organizations, the IMF and the World Bank were formed at this Princeton 
good confidence so this two are called as the benton woods twins okay they are called as the benton wood twins of the benton wood system the benton wood institutions okay the imf and the world bank commence financial operations in 1947 the conference was held in 1944 and 3 years later these two economic institutions which were monetary institutions which were formed the imf and the world bank world bank commence their financial operations from 1947 decisions making in this institutions were controlled by the industrial powers because they had formed this organization okay the western industrial powers they had formed this organization so all the decisions taken in this institutions were controlled by whom this western industrial powers and the us which had emerged as a strong power economic power it had the power to veto these decisions okay it had the right to veto the decisions taken by the imf or the world bank okay the international monetary system is the system linking national currencies and monetary systems you see different current, uh, countries have different nations have different currencies now all these currencies have been linked to a currency okay that is a link to they are pegged to a dollar at a fixed rate fixed exchange rate okay all the currencies of different different nations were pegged to the dollar at a fixed exchange rate and again this dollar itself was anchored to gold at a fixed rate of 35 dollars per ounce of gold that way this the currencies of different nations were linked with the dollar okay now let us come to 4.2 of the unit 4 that is the early post war years means soon after the war ended what had happened what was happening the bretton woods system inaugurated an era of unprecedented growth of trade and income for the western industrial nations and japan now basically this was this uh, two institutions were formed by the western industrial nations so naturally because of the formation of this two institutions the growth of trade and income started taking place rapidly world trade grew at it at over 8% between 1950 and 1970 and the income rate by nearly 5% the growth was also stable not much of fluctuations for much of this period the unemployment rate also averaged less than 5% in most of this industrial countries okay in this years at this time there was a worldwide spread of technology and enterprise developing countries also wanted to match with this industrial powers so they started inventing investing large capital on importing industrial plants and equipments featuring modern technology okay now after the world war 2 uh, you could see still many of the asian countries african countries were still colonies of the western power but later on after um in the next two decades after the war was over from 1945 to 1965 in this two decades around 20 years most of these countries got free okay they became independent nations okay but they became independent but there was a lot of poverty unemployment they in this countries because the colonial powers had already taken all the natural resources from 
uh, mineral resources, natural resources from this country to their parent country. So, these colonies which had now become free, they were poverty strapped. There was a lot of uh, poverty in this uh, uh, in these countries. Okay. Now, the IMF and the World Bank, they were designed by the industrial powers. So, they were mostly designed. The all. They were mostly designed to develop, okay, the financial to look after the financial needs of these countries, okay, of the industrial countries. So they were not equipped to cope with the poverty of the developing countries. But what happened was that by 1950, Britain and Japan they showed a fast raise in industrial growth. And that dependence on this IMF and, uh, and the World Bank came down. So now they were not much dependent on this two uh, monetary institutions. Okay. So now the, these two monetary institutions could now pay some attention to the developing countries which were poor. Okay. See, this, all these colonies were, they were a part of the Western European uh, powers. Okay, all these colonies were part of the Western European powers. So these Western Euro European powers ruled them before independence. And ironically, what happened after independence? Again, what happened after independence? These two monetary institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, which were again ruled, who had formed them? The West Industrial Powers. They started taking decisions. So these countries had to still depend on indirectly on the Western powers even after their independence. Okay. So even after many years of decolonization, the former colonial powers still controls vital minerals, resources and land in many of these countries. Because they were controlled by the IMF and the World Bank. Large corporations of powerful countries like the US, they often manage to secure rights to exploit developing countries' natural resources very cheaply. So the bigger enterprises of these countries, big companies, they had their rights on the mineral resources of many of these countries. So though these countries had become independent, they were still in a way what depending on this industrial power. Well, it looked like you, though they were politically independent, economically they were not independent. Economically they still had to depend on the Western industrial powers. Okay. Most developing countries did not benefit, so what you see, the most developing countries did not benefit from the World Bank or the IMF. Okay, so the Western economics, economies, they had benefited in the 1920s from these two institutions, but the same benefit was not been given to the developing countries. So these developing countries, they thought that they should come together. Okay, they should come together to and they organize themselves in a group which was called as the Group 77 or G77. Why was this group formed, the G77? To demand a new international economic order or you can call it NIEO. The new international economic order. And what do you mean by NIO? NIO meant a system that will give them real control over their natural resources. Now it seems the, the resources are in the territory of these countries. But who is controlling them? The companies which are belonging to the Western uh, countries. Okay. So first it meant a system that will give them real control of the natural resources more development assistance, fairer prices for raw materials and better access 
for their manufactured goods in developed countries markets okay which they were not getting there through the imf and the world bank the western countries were forcing their decisions okay that is why the necessity of g77 despite years of stable and rapid growth not all was well in this post war world okay from the 1960s the rising cost of its overseas involvement had weakened the us finances and competitive strength now the us dollar did not command commanded confidence in the world's principal currency as the world's principal currency it could not maintain its value in relation to gold it was considered it should it should maintain its value of 35 dollars per ounce of gold but it was not possible by now for the us to maintain it so it eventually led to the collapse of the system of fixed exchange rate and and the introduction of a new system called the floating exchange rate came into being see from the mid 1970s the international financial system also changed in important ways okay the international financial system also changed okay developing countries could turn to international institutions for loans and development assistance now developing countries like india now they could go to international uh, institutions for loans and development before they used to but now they were forced to borrow from western commercial banks and private lending institutions this led to periodic debt crisis in the developing world and led to lower incomes and increase in poverty especially in africa and latin america okay the industrial world again was hit by unemployment that began rising in the mid 1970s and was very much high unemployment rate was very much high till the 1990s from the late 1970s mnc's also started began to shift production to low wage asian countries mnc started uh, their factories in developing countries why in developing countries because it was feasible it was more um, advantage is for them to start a factory in the developing countries because wages in the developing countries were less compared to the wages in developed countries so the mnc the multinational companies started operations in developing countries china had been cut off from the post war world war economy since 1949 after its revolution okay by new economic policies in china and the collapse of the soviet union and soviet style communism in eastern europe brought many countries back into the fold of the world economy okay so there were some uh, chinese new economic policies and after the collapse of the soviet union many countries came back into the fold of the world economy china in china the wages were very low okay the wage structure in china because of the population huge population the wage structure in china was very low thus it became an attractive destination so mnc thought it's a nice place where they can start start their factory because there they will have to pay less wages okay so many foreign mnc's they started the units in china so most of the tvs mobile phones and toys we see in the shops today are chinese that's one of the reasons because of the low wages in china there the the low cost structure china is known for its low cost structure okay the low the relocation of industries to low wage countries stimulated world 
T and capital flows. Okay. So as MNC started operating in developing countries, capital started flowing from developed countries to developing countries. Okay. So in the last two decades, the world's economic geography has transformed. Okay, the world in the last 20 years, the economic geography of the world has transformed as countries such as China, India and Brazil have gone through rapid economic transformations. Okay, what is an MNC by the way? Here you have been shown in page number 100, what is an MNC? What is an MNC? Multinational corporations are large companies that operate in several countries at the same time. Okay, companies like Pepsi, companies like Coke, Coca-Cola. Okay, these are multinational companies. Companies like Samsung. These are all multinational companies. Companies like Ford. So there are so many other companies which have uh, operations in many different countries. The first MNC was established in the 1920s. Many more came up in the 1950s and 60s as US business expanded worldwide and Western Europe and Japan also recovered to become powerful industrial economies. Okay. The worldwide spread of MNCs was a notable feature of the 1950s and 60s. MNCs started coming out, coming from America, okay, the, or the developed countries as establishing their units, the factories in many developing countries. Why? Because as I told you before, of the low cost structure, because of the low wages. Now here they had to pay very, very less wage compared to their old country, their developed countries. Okay. Second thing, the import tariffs were high. So if you start manufacturing in that country, you don't have to import. Import tariffs on finished goods was high. So if you are manufacturing that country, then that product becomes an, the product made in that country. So you don't have in, import tariff. Okay. So they became domestic pro producers. That were the reasons why many MNCs came into developing countries. And this helped in transforming the economies of all these different companies. That's what we see the economy growing. In companies like uh, in countries like China and India, okay. With this, we end up with this chapter, okay. The making of a global world. I hope you have understood this chapter. If not, go to this lecture again once again. If you have not understood anything, any term which you have not understood, if you are having any problem, any query, please get back to me, okay. Through WhatsApp, you can get back to me. I am time best to solve your queries. Good day.